So Alicia, I wanted to point out these, um, these grooves oh. in the rock here. You can see them um, kind of sloping off on this generally smooth limestone surface. But they're all almost more or less parallel to one another. Um, and these were scratch marks in the rock that were made by um, the glacier as it flowed um, over this rock surface. And in actuality, it wasn't the ice that was scratching the rocks, it was rocks that were caught within the ice, um, or else uh, rocks that were in, in this material called glacial till that was sat beneath the, um, between the ice and the underlying rocks. But point being that um, the orientation of these scratch marks or glacial striations um, indicates the direction the ice was moving. And from our perspective, we can look directly along those striations up right along the lake. It's north. And we're looking right north. Yeah. And that's the direction the ice was coming from. It's, it's kind of amazing, Stephen, to think about that. I mean, at one point, you know, a mile and a half, two miles of ice over our heads, flowing down through the Champlain Valley, mm -hmm. covering both Vermont and New York, you know, and evidence of that on both sides of the lake and right here where we're standing. And right here where we're standing. Now, one of the things we can't see here is that um, elsewhere in the valley, and particularly up in the mountains, you find an older set of these striations that are oriented not north-south, parallel to the valley, but they're oriented actually northwest, southeast. So it turns out that when the ice was really thick, thick enough to cover all of the Adirondacks, thick enough to cover all of the Green Mountains, the ice was actually flowing obliquely uh, across the valley, across the mountains, on its way down towards Cape Cod. But these striations here formed a little bit later when the ice was starting to thin and its direction was um, dictated by the orientation of the valley. In other words, the valley was constraining the ice here and um, it was flowing more or less due south. That's amazing. And there's so much in common between the two, the, the Champlain Valley and this, the, the valley here on the New York side. Um, and I'm just noticing, for instance, standing here, some of the birds we've been hearing. We saw a Caspian tern, and oh, nice. we saw some gulls, and here we are standing among uh, the scat of Canada geese. And you know, we could be <laughs> we could be over there, oh, but of we're on a little different kind of bedrock. And but we're surrounded by tree friends. I mean, we have a giant cottonwood in the background. We have some red cedars. We have green ash. These could all be along the lake uh, on the Vermont side. That's right. So, the, in other words, you're saying is that really what's growing here um, depends. We have similar sorts of rocks, we have similar sorts of soils, and we have a very similar climate uh, dictated by our elevation and this huge, big body of water right here. And I love that, looking at the bridge from here. <laughs> and it's a nice symbol of this connection of the two sides of Lake Champlain. I mean, it really is one watershed, it you is. know, one bioregion. It is. And uh, it's nice to be over here visiting this side of it. Hi, I want to welcome you to another Vermont Master Naturalist hike. And for this one, we've, we've uh, decided to do something different. We're mixing it up. And we're actually in New York. Um, we're at Crown Point, And I have Stephen Wright, a geologist who teaches in Vermont Master Naturalist, with me today. Or I'm with him on a field trip to look at the geology over here. But there's evidence over here, Stephen, of the same forces that shape the Vermont landscape, and we can see them at the surface of the land. And we're gonna be exploring that and some of the vegetation and other things uh, that are along the lake shore here. And I think one of the themes we're really looking at is lake is connector. You know, sometimes we think of the lake as a boundary between New York and Vermont, but there's really a lot of life that treats the whole watershed of Lake Champlain as habitat. So, And I should say too that um, from a geological point of view, um, we're always trying to go to places where we can learn a lot in a, efficiently. And the Crown Point historic site where we are today um, has a lot of 
rocks exposed, has a lot of, of, of other cool historical and natural history features that are very, very easily visible on publicly accessible land. Um, and so um, we can show you a lot in a, in a relatively small area. Thank you. Well, let's go explore. So, Stephen, in places along yeah. Lake Champlain, the lake itself kind of represents that boundary between the younger rock and the, the older rock. Um, but that isn't always true. Here, we've got some of that 500 million year old rock under our feet, and we're not really in the Meta North site. Right. Where does that, where do we see that along this view shed, you know, in terms of the old rock, right, coming down to the water? Right. So the lake correctly, you know, approximates the boundary between the um, the younger rocks to the east, um, mostly on the Vermont side, and the older rocks to the west, mostly on the New York side, but not exactly. Um, that boundary is actually one of a series of, of faults um, that um, you know, essentially bound those old rocks against these younger rocks. And here at Town Point um, is one of these places, is one of the places where these younger rocks um, are here at the surface. They're, they tend to weather differently. They tend to, um, you know, we're in an area that's not mountainous. It's part of the part of the valley. And you'll find other little enclaves like this over on the New York side as as well. And yet you can always go a little farther west, and you'll hit a fault, and then boom, you'll be in these older um, older rocks. And what you actually see in the landscape, we can see off. To the north northwest of us here, um, you can see that that hilly, rugged Adirondack landscape coming mm -hmm. right down to the lake shore. Um, and those are all those old um, metamorphic rocks, and they just they weather differently. They're they're rougher. They, they haven't made this nice smooth surface that you see over in in Vermont here. Um, and um, and because of that, of course, their land use history has been very, very different as well. Um, mm -hmm. That area there has never been terribly amenable to farming, right. you know, particularly on those on those slopes, um, both because of the steepness and because of the, um, the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, here, it's you know, it's, it's much less rugged. You know, we look across the lake to the Vermont side there, it almost almost looks pancake flat, yes. and that's in part because there's not much relief in the rocks. And it's also in part because there's a nice layer of glacial lake sediment um, and Champlain Sea sediment sitting on top of on top of those rocks. And so we have um, essentially really extensive areas of a very arable land um, um, on most of these areas that are underlain by this um, by these by these somewhat younger rocks. That's so cool. But that line, like when you look at a an, an aerial photo uh, of the topography and the vegetation of the U.S., you see a line mm -hmm. that runs from the Richelieu River down Lake Champlain, down the Hudson River, and it really is a real boundary between the old North American continent on this side, yeah. on the western side, and the newer rocks. Is that true um, mostly? That's, that's partly true. That's okay. partly is true. Is it true between Vermont and New York? Um, it's partly true. Okay. Okay. Right, right, right. Because there are Precambrian rocks down right, in right. the tectonics. So right. it turns out that, you know, again, yeah. right here, if we were to uh, drill a hole uh, and go down, we would eventually come to those those rocks those over there. Yeah. So in other words, those rocks are sitting high as a mountain range, the Adirondack Mountains here, but that doesn't mean that that's where they start. Yeah. And that's where they end. You know, we get over to the western side of Got the Adirondacks. It. They don't end there. They actually underlie a huge part of, of kind of eastern, the middle section of the U.S. Um, and again, some places they're up above the ground surface, and some places, many places, most places, they're actually buried. So, um, so again, here if we drill down, we go over to other parts of the Champlain Valley. Uh, and if you drill down deeply enough, you'll get through all of these overlying sedimentary rocks and boom, come into those, those older metamorphic rocks. And there are places where you can actually see that contact between the old rocks and then the 
essentially the beginning of the sedimentary rock. Um, there's some areas down not too far south of here um, um, where they're nicely exposed, um, and um, you can actually put your finger right on that right on that surface, and that was the land surface um, at the time that you know sediment sediment starting to started to accumulate on top of these old rocks. Um, you know, probably 550, 600 million years ago. Understood. Thank you. That's really helpful. There's a gastropod right there. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah. The snail shell. Right. Right, look. right. Right here. Good job. Yeah, I haven't seen any um, trilobites yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if they're in here somewhere. This, oh, this is a bryozoan. Bryozoan. And they're alive today. They're freshwater ones. Are they? Uh, yeah, Are I've seen them in um, the La Platte River. Five hundred million years ago. Um, this part of North America, um, first of all, would have been rotated about 90 degrees. So when we look off to our east now across the lake, um, 500 million years ago, we would have been looking south. And furthermore, um, we would have been south of the equator. Not very far, but south of the equator. So we would have been looking down towards the south south pole at that point, but very much an equatorial um, environment. Ready? Oh, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. I think my is starting to break. Try that again. Oh. I'm gonna let him go. Go. Alicia, there's some beautiful trees that are growing up on this outcrop here. Yeah, I'm spotting those, Stephen. And I, I remember in the natural community description of limestone bluff cedar pine forest that they talk about these white cedars as, as having twisted and upswept trunks and i feel like i'm seeing them right like that in new york Please. and look how the roots are just oh. working their way the soil thickness here is, is almost almost zero here they're really growing right right into the into and onto on, onto the rocks <laughs> it's so true these trees also as you know grow slowly Oh. So these trees could be quite old. I was at a spot in uh, um, Kingsland Bay where there had been a microburst. So there was wind coming from above. The um, hemlocks, the red pine, everything else came up by the roots. They were yeah. all windthrow. Uh, yeah, and yeah. the cedars snapped at the trunk. <laughs> it was easier to break them in half than to pull them up by their roots. Isn't that wild when that you think about wild. How, wild. how tenacious they are. Right. Very patient. Yeah. So first of all, these, these are referred to as, as metamorphic rocks. In other words, they were something else. They were put under a lot of pressure, a lot of heat, heated up, and, um, and, and they recrystallize. Um, so similar to the transition from limestone to dolostone. But here, the, these rocks were probably buried 25 to 30 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface when they went through that transition. So they didn't melt, but they were pretty um, getting close to their melting point. And there are a lot of chemical reactions that, that can occur when rocks get hot like that. Uh, <coughs> and that's, um, that's what this metamorphic process is. So the other big difference here is that is the age. These rocks are broadly about 1.2 billion years old, or 1,200 million, you know, probably more accurately, 11 to 1,200 million years old. Remember, those guys over there are roughly 
500 million years old. These are the rocks that underlie the Adirondack. Those are the rocks that underlie the Champlain Valley. And um, so there's a, there's a boundary here that we've walked over. You know, is it right underneath our feet here? Is it over there somewhere? You know, it's, it's close. Um, and um, this boundary is a, is a, big, is a big fault. Mm -hmm. um, so these rocks here have gone relatively up relative to those rocks over there, which have gone relatively down. Now, it could be that those rocks stayed in one place and these rocks were pushed up. It's just a relative motion. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this, is, this is one of the best examples of the border fault uh, between the two rocks. That's so cool. Yeah. But because those are sedimentary rocks, um, so they've never been heated up, they've never been put under pressure, um, and because we know that they're deposited on top of older rocks like this, um, we know that if we want to find these rocks over there, we have to go way down. So that's how we know that the rock, you know, right where we're standing or somewhere in here, we've gone down relative to these rocks over here. If there's this upper layer um, that looks pretty uniform and intact, and then we get down to the rusty layer down here again, so they're they're parallel with one another. And then we come down into the, the marble. Um, and within the marble, um, you can see that there's a very snake-like looking layer. But there are also other things that it almost um, look like chocolate chips and some chocolate chip dough. They're blocky. Very blocky. Uh, things kind of turned, partially folded. And um, what we're seeing here is um, a huge difference in mechanically in the way that different layers of rock are behaving. So the, the marble is really, really soft. It's, it's, um, um, it deforms very, very easily. Um, the other rocks at the same temperature and pressure, you know, um, some of them were very brittle. They were breaking. You can see they have these angular edges on them. Mm -hmm. And so um, as this rock was being deformed, and again, remember, we're 25 or 30 kilometers down. Um, another way to think about it is that at the time that these rocks were being metamorphosed, we may have been beneath the mountain belt similar to the to the Himalayan range. And, but, you know, not up at the surface, but way, way, way down. And, and essentially these rocks subjected to these immense pressures um, and trying to slide past one another. And as that's happening, some of the rocks that are kind of strong and brittle are breaking up within this, this marble soup, if you will. And mm -hmm. soup probably isn't a very good term because it um, implies that it's liquid. And I don't think the marble actually was liquid because it still retains its layering here. Um, but something very, very, you know, hard things and something very, very soft. Um, marble porridge, how's that? Okay. A marble <laughs> stew. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's, yeah, I'm really glad. That. Um, Oh, it works even answer. better. So cool. And here's another piece when that one runs out. So. <laughs> Did you know you could draw with rocks? That's pretty fun. <laughs> I knew. So, so we snuck out here on this point at Crown Point, and we're looking at some of the birds that live along and in the islands of the lake. I'm already I'm seeing a kingfisher fly over. But out here on the point, we have Caspian terns and we have ring-billed gulls. And we saw a raft of regansers with her babies. Um, 
The thing I want to tell about the ringbill gulls is they did not nest in Lake Champlain until the late, uh, till the till 1950s, till the 1950s, and then a couple of pairs of them showed up um, on the sister islands up Ooh, off of um, Grand Isle, and they and the four brothers. So they showed up in some islands, and they had a very different ecology. They had a different life strategy than herring gulls, which had been here since people had been recording history. So the ringbill uh, came into the Chamblee Valley. We think they spread down here due to new food sources um, like trash dumps and also agricultural fields where they were eating worms and they started to breed in the area and their populations grew by 17% each year and they, they just exploded from that first pair to the thousands of gulls. And they started, because they nest up under the vegetation on these islands, they actually started denuding the islands of vegetation. The trees died, the shrubs died, and they just, if you've seen the Four Brother Islands, you know what it looks like out there. So it's just sort of an interesting story of a species extending their range, um, in this case south, um, into the Champlain Valley, and the impact it had on some of our forested islands. Um, the Caspian terns are another story um, but I just love to watch them hunt uh, they're, you'll, you, they're easily mistaken for a gull but they're more of a sort of streamlined version and they they hunt with their head down they have a long orange bill and you can see them searching for fish in the water and enjoy watching them dive they have a real sort of um, crackly call when they call it's it's harsh and different than a gull call but anyway, it's nice to be out here in New York and seeing things that we see in Vermont and understand the lake isn't really a barrier between our two states. It's actually a connector in many ways between habitats, you know, on both sides of Lake Champlain. Thank you for joining us on another Vermont Master Naturalist hike. And thank you, Stephen, for bringing us across the lake to New York to think about Vermont Very and the, good. the geology that connects us and the waters that connect us and the natural communities that connect us across time and space. I really appreciate that. What was your favorite thing today? I think I don't, well, my brain's a little fogged because of the heat, but I will say that uh, most recently, right here at Crown Point, I, I love the outcrops with the different glacial striations. It does have the striations reflecting a kind of an, a relatively recent geological history and the rocks with the fossils in them kind of bringing in that sort of that older history. And then we can look across the lake at the foothills of the Adirondacks here, you know, piecing together an even older history. So, yes, and connecting it to Rock Point and Dress Vaults and Dolestone going on in the Vermont, in my backyard, not quite exactly, your backyard, exactly, yes. Okay, right. so get down here on my level. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>